I get asked this question all the time. As a matter of fact, for 23 years, 23 years, I have been asked this same question every year for 23 years. Somebody will inevitably ask me this question, and it's been the same question for 23 straight seasons, 23 straight years, is people will ask this question in this way. They will say, how did you get that gig? And that's the question. How did you get that gig? They are talking about how did you become the team chaplain, the team pastor for the Phoenix Suns? And they will ask, every year, somebody asks me, somebody will send me a direct message, somebody will ask me in person, how, but they say it like this, how did you get that gig? How did you get that gig? Now, I have held the privilege and the honor of serving as the Phoenix Suns chaplain for 23 years. I was 26 years old when I started. 26 years old when I started with the Phoenix Suns, I have been the chaplain for major and minor league baseball for 12 years of my life. I've been the chaplain for the Arizona Cardinals. Most of you know this, but this church started as a Bible study for the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, I always say that this church is the best thing that ever came out of the Arizona Cardinals, and it's not even close. But this church started as a Bible study for the Arizona Cardinals, and it's crazy for me to be at a Thursday night service with the young people of Impact Church and see so many of you because I remember 14 years ago, by the way, Pastor Darius and Pastor Whitney, did you know that today, today, exactly today, is 14 years? My first Sunday was 14 years ago today. And 14 years ago today, we were in a different building on the other side of the runway, and I preached my first sermon to 204 total people. That was everybody, kids, adults, babies, everybody, 204 people. And then here we are 14 years later in our young adults ministry, and we have about 800 of you in this service alone. You guys, come on, that's incredible. That's incredible. Isn't it amazing what God can do with a seed. Let, let, let me be more specific. Isn't it amazing to, to see what God can do with the seed that is planted? What is the difference between having a seed and planting a seed? See, a lot of you today, you have a seed, but you've not planted the seed. And unless you plant the seed, that seed remains dead. In fact, I want to read to you the words of Jesus himself in the book of John, chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if, somebody say if, but if, somebody say if, but if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. PT, how did you get that gig? PT, how did you get that gig? PT, how did you get 23 straight years? PT, how did you get that gig? Now, first of all, I would like to say that that question bothers the living mess out of me because this is not a gig. The Phoenix Suns ministry is not a gig. It is ministry. It is ministry. It is ministry. It is service to the most high God. It is not a gig. It is a ministry and it is something that I must be faithful to serve, to steward, and to serve and to steward well. Because God's been working on me this whole month, and so I know we're into the next month, but for me, personally, this might not be for you, but for me, 
God has been showing me my, my word for July. God's word to Travis Hearn for July was, I didn't call you to serve. I called you to serve well. I, I'm not asking you to serve. I'm asking you to serve well. You got to serve well. Remember when we stand before Jesus one day, we want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yeah, that's what this whole life is about. It's about serving well. So this chaplain thing is about serving well. Say, how did you get that gig? How did you get that gig? Now, most of you know that I got radically saved at 17 years old. I got, I mean, when I talk about radically saved, I, I got radically saved on fire. I'm, I mean, like oddly, strangely, weirdly, like I lost my mind on fire for Jesus Christ. I got radically saved at the end of my senior year in high school. I'm an Arizona native. For those of you that don't know, I grew up playing sports. I played basketball. I played baseball. I played football. I was the quarterback of my football team, the catcher of my baseball team. I was the point guard of my basketball team. I excelled in all three of those. I, I also, I also, one of my favorite sports in high school was partying. Oh yeah, man, I knew how to party. I knew how to party. I knew how to throw a party, right? I would drink my face off all through high school. I would be doing drugs. I was doing what most young people do, pleasing my flesh, wandering through life, not understanding that I had a bigger purpose. And I'm just trying to please my flesh. So if it pleased my flesh, you could count me in. And so I was doing all the things that I shouldn't be doing. And on the outside, on the outside, on the outside, man, it looked like that dude's got it all together. But on the inside, I was completely falling apart. And on the outside, it looked like, man, this guy's successful. He's a great athlete. But on the inside, I was empty. I was empty. I needed something in, in my life. I, I just didn't know what I needed. And the end of my senior year in high school, we got knocked out of our basketball playoffs. And a few weeks after, my uh, coach, he was a 45-year-old teacher at our school. This is crazy. Y'all ready for this story? This is crazy. He calls me, and this is back in the day before we had cell phones, so y'all know nothing about this. <laughs> There was a phone attached to the wall and you had to stand by the wall and you had to pick it up off the wall and you had to say hello. You know how today you can block people? We used to block people by just leaving the phone off the hook. Then you couldn't get a hold of us. And so I was on the phone and my coach said, hey, my car broke down. Would you give me a ride tomorrow to the Allstate selections? 45 year old teacher my basketball coach for that one year. And I was like, yeah, I'll give you a ride, sure. So I take him all the way from my house was an hour drive to this high school. I drop him off because I couldn't go in with him. I'm an athlete, a student athlete. He comes out a couple hours later and he's got this big cheesy smile on his face. And he says, congratulations, Travis, you made first team all state for basketball. Now, if you are an athlete, do I have any athletes in here today? Any athletes at all in here today? If you are an athlete, you kind of know where you stand versus the rest of the competition. I mean, I kind of figured this would be an award of achievement that I would receive because I basically slayed everybody I ever played. So this wasn't some big like, no way. It was what it was expected. And he says, here's what wasn't expected. He says, you may, and then he goes, do you want to go celebrate? I'm pretty street smart, you know what I'm saying? I think everybody's trying to bait me. And, and so I was like, well, you know, like, well, you know, what do you have in mind? And he said, this calls for celebration. I got a friend who lives down the road. I'm going to buy all the alcohol you can drink tonight. And as a 17 year old, non unsaved, non-Christian dude, I was like, yes, we're doing that. You know, because when you're a, mi a minor, you got to find a buyer. I don't have to find a buyer tonight. Like, let's, let's go. 
We go to this house. We got plowed drunk. I'm an hour away from home, and I've got to still drive home. I start to drive home. I get about halfway home, and you know the story. All of a sudden, red and blue lights, they turn on behind me. I get pulled over. I get cited for a DUI. I get taken to jail here in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a Saturday night at midnight in February, and my mother gets a phone call that her son has been thrown into jail and arrested for DUI. I actually got cited with four different citations. I got a DUI. I got failure to stay within the lines. I got failure to show proof of insurance because I was too drunk to show it and some other citation that I can't remember. And my mom was crushed. And around my middle school years, she got insanely on fire for Jesus Christ. And man, she was crushed that her son was in jail for DUI. And she had to come get me. Because I was a minor, they couldn't keep me overnight. And when we got back to my neighborhood, my mother asked me this question. I'm in the back of the car. My mother and her sister are in the front of the car. And my mom said, Travis, do you want to go by our pastor's house? Have you ever just tried to ignore your parent and then like maybe it goes away? <laughs> and I didn't say anything. And another five minutes goes by. My mom don't play. She ain't, she don't ever play. And she goes, son, I asked you a question. Do you want to go to my, it's midnight on a Saturday night. Listen, if any of y'all get a DUI on a Saturday night at midnight, do not come to my house. I need to sleep and I need to preach Sunday morning. And I'm thinking like, this woman is not gonna let go. And I did not want to go to their house, but out of my mouth, I said yes. <laughs> I was at that house from midnight till 4.30 a.m. talking with the pastor. And that was the night that I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. But listen, listen, listen. It's amazing what a seed will do if you plant it. It's amazing because I know about 12 of you started to clap. Out of 800, about 12 of you started to clap. But if I had not given my life to Jesus Christ that night, if I hadn't surrendered my life, surrendered my life to Jesus Christ that very night, you would not be here today because this church would not exist today. If I had not surrendered, if I had not surrendered, because listen, because listen, listen, listen. Many of you are just like I was. You're surrounded but not surrendered. You're surrounded by church people. You're surrounded by the word of God. You're surrounded by family members, but you're not surrendered. And until you surrender, see, it's when you surrender is when the seed is actually planted. For many of my own years, I was surrounded, but not surrendered. Some of you today, you're surrounded. You're surrounded by God. You're surrounded by church. You're surrounded by church people, but you're not surrendered. And the real truth of the matter is, if I had not gotten plastered, if I didn't have a love for basketball, if I hadn't become an elite athlete, if I hadn't received those awards, if I wasn't put in jail, if I hadn't received a DUI in February of my senior year in high school, Impact Church would not exist. It's amazing what God can do with the seed that's planted. It's amazing. I wonder today if you'll move from surrounded to surrender. I wonder if you'll move from surrounded to surrendered, and I wonder if you'll actually move from being surrounded to being surrendered, how God will use that to impact people in their lives for eternity. I wonder today whose lives hang in the, in the limbo and it 
and, and their eternity depends on you moving from surrounded to surrender. I just wonder how many lives will be impacted if you take that seed and you plant that seed and you bury that seed. But then there's this weird part of me that actually wonders the opposite. I wonder how many lives today, tomorrow, next month, next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20, 30, 50. I wonder how many lives will not be impacted because some of you today, you're going to walk out still surrounded, but not surrendered. I wonder if there are lives that won't find hope, they won't find peace, they won't find purpose, they won't find joy, because you're going to continue to stay surrounded and not surrender. Yeah, and that is a good word, but it's not even what I'm preaching on today. It's not even what I'm preaching on today. But it is a word. How did you get that gig. How did you get that gig? After I had gotten saved, I became radically on fire for Jesus Christ. I mean, I'm going to church every night of the week, not just Sundays. If the doors were open, I was there. I wanted to be in church every possible opportunity. I could be in church. I, I got addicted to the presence of God. I got addicted to being set free from the power of God. I got addicted for, 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 for the real, the real deal. I didn't get addicted to just like going to church to play church. I got addicted to seeing God loose people free and set people free and deliver the demon possessed and fill people with the spirit of God. And I witnessed people start speaking in other tongues like, man, I was like, dude, this is what I'm here for. I am here for the real deal. And a couple months after I got saved, which was crazy, which is crazy. I, I got to I got to take a moment just to, 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 to paint this picture. It's not that I just got saved like I. It's like I'm the star athlete in all three sports. It's like, it's like if there was a party, I was the party. It was like, where are we going to party? We're going to party over there. We're going to party. Imagine removing that guy from all of that. And I go from going to school with a backpack with a basketball in it to the biggest, thickest, blackest Bible you've ever seen in your lives. And I'm walking around campus and people are like, yo, what happened to you? And I'm like, I got saved. And other people in high school are like, what'd you get saved from? And I'm like, I don't even fully know yet, but all I know is I got saved. That's what they told me what happened to me. I got saved. And when I figure out what I got saved from, I'll let you know what I got saved from. That's, that's the, 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 the picture. Everybody was tripping. The whole school was tripping. Everybody was tripping. I had a dude that lived with me my senior year of high school. He was making bets with everybody because people were like, oh, he's going through a phase. He'll be back out partying by summer. Dude that lived with me, his name was Bryce. He knew better. I'd go home and I'd be like, bro. And I was telling and teaching him the word. And I'm like, bro, I got filled with the spirit of God tonight. I started speaking in tongues and he was seeing the truth. He was seeing the truth. He was living it. He was in my room with me, sharing a bedroom with me. He's making money off me. He's not an idiot. And a couple months after uh, I gave my life to Christ, we had this missionary come through and preach at my church. And he was talking about all these mission trip opportunities. Has anybody ever been on a mission trip? If you've been on a mission trip, raise your hand. Come on, raise it. If you've never been on a mission trip, you should go on one of our Impact Church mission trips. We have them all throughout the year. They, they are life-changing. They are life-changing. We had this preacher come in and he's talking about all these missions trips and he was talking about opportunities where we could go and we could serve and we could share our testimony. And he's, he's talking, have you ever been in church and there's a lot of people in church with you, but you felt like that message was literally only for you? Like it was God speaking to you and I knew that God was speaking to me and I knew that God was calling me on this specific mission trip to go to Mazatlan, Mexico for a 10-day mission trip. 
Man, I knew so much. I signed up that day right there after service. I went up and I met the missionary, and I'm like, man, I'm coming. I'm supposed to be going. It's cool. Never even been out of the country at that time in my life. I grew up poor. Anybody grow up poor? Like, I'm poor. I mean, poor. She didn't grow up poor. We're in Scottsdale, Arizona. Y'all don't know. There's types of poor. Like, I grew up poor, poor. I grew up with a single mama, worked four jobs. She waited tables. She was a cake decorator. She also worked at Safeway and, and, and then also cleaned houses. We were poor, poor, poor. So coming up with the money for the, the, the missions trip, I was like, man, I don't know how I'm going to raise all, all that money because I know mama ain't got it. Hey, listen, if you'll do something great for God, the money will follow you. Listen, listen, listen. Where, where there's vision, there's provision. If you want to do something great for God, where God guides, God provides. If you want to do something great for God, people start going, oh, man, I'm going to help that guy. I'm going to help that girl. I'm going to help them. Do. And so I raised my money, and honestly, it was easy. And I started going to these trainings on this mission trip, you know, and I was going once a week to these trainings, and, and uh, man, I was, I was like, this is new, man. This is so, it's all so new. It's all so overwhelming. It's a, they were like, hey, we're going to have you, your, your testimony so crazy. We're going to have you share it. We're going to have a translator with you. And, 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 and like one of the very first times I ever preached in my entire life, I preached with a translator. You know, it's like we're going to have a translator with you. And I'm like, okay. I said, you know, I, I, I've never even publicly spoken before, but like I'm going to do my best. And no, just share your testimony. Just share your testimony. Just share your test. All you got to do is just tell your story. Listen, Riley, all you got to do is just tell your story. All you got to do is tell your story. Some of you want to be like Darius and Whitney on this stage. and Now, nah, God says, just start sharing your story. Just start preaching where you are. Preach in your neighborhood. Preach in your job. Be the missionary to the workplace. Be the missionary to your college campuses. And I remember thinking, like, man, I'm so excited about this business trip. Like, it's crazy. Why am I so excited? to go to Mexico. And then I remember I got this envelope in the mail. You know those big manila envelopes? Travis Hearn. And it was from an organization called the AIA, which is the Arizona Interscholastic Association. They're also known as demons. I don't like any of them. But I got this packet, and I opened this packet. Would you believe it was a congratulatory packet? And it said, congratulations, Travis Hearn. You have made the Arizona All-Star team for basketball. You are one of 12 players selected to play in the Arizona All-Star game. Now, back when I was a kid many, 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 many hundreds of years ago, Arizona used to have an all-star game. They don't actually do that anymore. I wish they still did it. It was pretty dope. And I remembered, like, man, I went to that all-star game every year since I was a little boy. Since I was a little boy, I would go watch that all-star game. Like, one day, I want to play in this all-star game. One day, I'm going to play. It was actually part of my motivation for just keep training, keep training, keep training, keep working, keep working, keep working. I wanted to play. And here it was, man, I get to play in this all-star game, and I was so I was so excited until I looked at the next page and the dates of the Arizona All-Star Game and events were the exact same dates as this missions trip to Mazatlan. And I know, you know, for you, that's an easy decision. When I mean the exact same dates, I mean the exact same dates. From beginning to end, exact same dates. The exact same 10 days. The exact same 10 days. So here's the question. How did you get that gig? 23 years, same question. How did you get that gig? 
See, this was a major decision for my life. Do I play in this Arizona high school all-star game? Something I've dreamed about since I was a little boy. Something I've always wanted to do. Or I go on this mission trip that I felt like God wanted me to go on. That I felt like, man, I knew that I knew that I knew God wanted me. Do I play in this Arizona high school all-star game? And do I put the spotlight on Travis Hearn? Or do I go on this mission trip and put the spotlight on Jesus Christ? Which is it? Are you going to serve yourself or are you going to serve God? Are you going to put the light on you or put the light on him for me it was a tough decision it was a tough decision man when I look back little did I know it was also a decision that would define the rest of my life it's amazing what God will do with the seed that's planted and I knew that 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 God told me to go on that mission trip. So even though I had to make a decision, I had actually already made the decision. I already knew the answer because God told me to go on this mission trip. So listen, I called the AIA myself, which you're not even supposed to do. Student athletes aren't allowed to call the AIA. I called the AIA and I said, listen, I am not going to be able to play in the all-star game. I said, I appreciate it. I'm so excited that I made the team. The accomplishment and the letter itself is amazing to me, but I'm not going to be able to play because I'm going on a missions trip. This guy was so respectful, but so confused. <laughs> he said, Travis, why? And I said, because I got saved. I did. I said, because I got saved. And he said, man, I respect your decision and I respect what you're doing with your life, but aren't there 51 other weeks where you could go on a missions trip? Man, I wish I had this phone call recorded, but they hadn't made recorders back then at this time in the history of life. He was so confused. Aren't there 51 other weeks you could go on a missions trip? And the truth is, there were 51 other weeks I could have gone on a missions trip. That is an absolute fact. But God told me to go on this one. God told me this missions trip, not 51 other missions trip. God told me this one. And everyone, everyone, listen, listen, everyone, Everyone thought I was crazy. Everyone, everyone thought I was crazy. Parents, coaches, teachers, friends, teammates, everybody thought that I had lost my mind. And the truth is, I did lose my mind. Because Matthew 16, 24 says this, forever, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, for me, will find it. Come on, let's read it out loud. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life, for me, will find it. So yeah, I guess I kind of lost my mind. I hope that I've still lost my mind. I hope that people still think I'm crazy and they still think I'm radical and they still think what no, no normal person thinks. I don't want to be a normal person. I want to lose it all for Christ's sake. And that man, that man, the AIA dude, that dude, he was so confused. He asked me, are you sure? He said, are you sure, Travis? He said, this is a lot to give up. And I said, I already gave it up. I already gave it. Listen, listen. Up. That's what I'm going to preach on today. I know it took me a little while to get there, but that's what I want to preach on today is that I need to give it up. Come on, somebody say, give it up. Give it up. Do, do like this. Give it up. Give it up. Look up to the heavens and say, God, I'm going to give it up. 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 I gave it up. How did you get that gig? 
How did you get that gig? How did you get that opportunity? Listen, rally family, it's not like I had connections. You know what I'm saying? It's like my son right now has connections. My son, Josiah, is the most connected son maybe in Arizona. I could get that dude a job anywhere he wanted. He wants to be in ministry at the church, but he is connected. That boy grew up with NBA, NFL, MLB players in his home since he was a baby. He doesn't know any different. He has no idea. I mean, he's my little roadie, man. We go everywhere together. We're over at OBJ's house several times within the last four weeks. It means nothing to him. That's just the world he grew up in. But for me, Man, I didn't have any connections. I didn't have a dad that was connected. I didn't have a mama that was connected. Unless you needed somebody's house to stay in because she cleaned some houses. I was not connected. How did you get that gig? I didn't know anybody in pro sports. I'd never met a pro athlete. I didn't know a pro anything. I didn't know anybody that knew anybody that knew anybody. I did not know anybody except that I knew a guy named Jesus Christ who became my Lord and Savior. And when you give everything to him, the favor of God that will fall on your life is absolutely unbelievable. What I'm saying is I gave it, I gave it up. I gave it up because the truth is basketball had become my idol. It had become a God in my life. And I mean, I love sports, but I really love basketball. And basketball became so elevated in my life yeah, I had given my life to Jesus Christ. Yeah, I got saved. But God wanted to know if I'd give up the one thing that I love most for him. How'd you get that gig? At 17 years old, I gave it up. How'd you get that gig? At 17 years old, I gave it up. I know many of you today say, ah, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't seem like, but that was my everything. See, what I'm trying to say, this isn't about me. This is about you today. God wants to see if you will take the one thing that you love the most and give it up for Jesus Christ. Will you take it? At 17 years old, nine years later, nine years, nine years after I became a Christian, nine years after I went on that missions trip, nine years after I chose not to play in that high school all-star game, nine years later, after I had given it up, God gave it back times a million. God gave it back times a million. Do you know I didn't even know pro sports had ministries? I didn't even know there were such things as chaplains. When you give something up, listen, God now sees the trueness of your heart. I didn't give it up to get it back. I gave it up. I didn't give it up and go, man, if I give this up one day, God will give me, give me, give me. I gave it up because I said, Jesus, this has been an idol in my life and it's unhealthy. And I put this before you and I put this before everybody else. So God, I'm going to give it up. I'm going to give it up. See, this story really isn't about me. This really is not about me. It's about you. Because every single person in this room right now has something that can take the place of God if it already hasn't. That's called an idol. What are you holding on to today? What are you holding on to that you are not willing to give up 
See, it could be a relationship. It could be a man. It could be a woman. It could be status. It could be money. What is holding you back? It could be an excuse. Man, people are great excuse makers. It could be a failure holding you back. It could be a failure. It could be an emotion. It could be insecurity. God wants you to do something great. Well, I don't know. I'm just, I'm so insecure. You are in your own way. What are you holding on to that God wants you to give up? It could be fear. It could be shame. It could be guilt. What are you holding on to that's actually holding you back? God says, will you give it up? Will you give it up? Will you give it up? Will you take whatever you've been holding on to and let go of it and lay it at the altar, at the feet of Jesus? Because most people, if they're honest, can't do it. How did you get that gig? You gave it up. How did you get that gig? I gave it up. I gave it up. Do you remember the story of Abraham and Isaac? God promised Abraham a son. 25 years later, Abraham's 100 years old, and he finally has his son. That's a long wait, fam. That's a long wait. If God told you something and he gave you a word, hey, sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes there's a season of waiting, and you've got to be faithful, and you've got to trust God in the wait. i got to trust God in the wait, man. I know that God's got a special woman for me. I might have to wait. God's got a special man for me. I might have to wait, but I'm going to be faithful in the wait, I'm gonna be faithful. Abraham waits 25 years for that promise to be fulfilled. And listen, I wanna say this, if God says it, you better believe it. It's, it's a matter of fact. And it might not be on your timeline, but it will absolutely be on God's timeline. And Abraham finally had this son. I know what it's like to have a son. I know what it's like to have a one and only son. Jesus says that, that in John 3, 16, it says that for God so loved the world that he gave his, his, his one and only, only begotten, his one and only son. Abraham had one true-blooded son with his wife, Sarah. He had one. That was his one. That was a promise that God gave him. That was a promise that he waited for. I'm sure after two years, three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 18 years, 20 years, you start to question like, God, are you serious? I don't think, I must have heard from a different, that wasn't God. I didn't hear from the, you start to question the very word of God. God answered the prayer and gave him this son. Abraham finally has a son. This is where the story gets wild. In Genesis chapter 22, verses one and two. It says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Look at somebody and tell them, God will test you. Tell, tell somebody, God will test you. God tested Abraham. And he said to Abraham, and he said, Abraham! Abraham, and Abraham says, God, I'm right here. Here I am, God. Then God said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. You probably know the rest of the story, but Abraham obeys God. He takes his one and only son, Isaac, 
up to the mountaintop, the son he loved most, the son that he waited a hundred years to have. And he ties his son to the altar. Listen, this is crazy. Listen, it, right before Abraham takes his son's life, Genesis chapter 22, verse 12, he says, right before, right before he takes his son's life, God says, Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. God provides a ram in the thicket. Listen, God is asking you the same thing today. What is your Isaac? What is your Isaac? God is saying, whatever your Isaac is, I want it. I want you to lay it down for me. Everybody has an Isaac. Are you willing to lay it down? Are you willing to lay it on the altar for Jesus Christ? Are you willing to give it up? Yeah. Don't worry, I'm coming in for the landing. You're going to land the plane in just a minute. But the landing's always the funnest. The thing I love more than anything else in life, he's got to give it to God. And he actually didn't say to sacrifice his son. He said to offer him as a sacrifice. To offer him, which means God's not taking it. I'm offering it. I'm offering it. God, I'm going to give it to you. It's amazing what God will do with the seed that's planted. It's amazing to do what God will do with the seed that's buried into the earth for him. He said to offer. You remember in Luke 9? Does anybody know the word of God or do you just listen to Pastor Darius and Pastor Whitney preach it? Like, do you actually know, know the word? Because there's this great passage in Luke 9. Jesus is talking. Luke, Luke 9 is a really long chapter, 62 verses. And, and he says this, Jesus he said to another man, follow me. Will you say those two words out loud? Follow me. Will you all say those two words out loud? Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but at first glance, this sounds crazy. Follow me. Well, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father. No, I said, follow me. Let the dead bury their own dead. Follow me. Yeah, Jesus, I'll follow you. But first, let me go say goodbye to my family. No, follow me. Anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And that might sound incredibly hardcore to you today. But Jesus is telling you to follow me today, right now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not next month. I want you to follow me right now. No but first, no excuses. No, let me do this first, God. Let me do that first, God. It, it doesn't matter what the reason is. Let's make up a really good one. Oh, my dad died. I need to go bury him. And that sounds crazy. Let the dead bury their own dead. 
But I started thinking, what a word. What a word. Because God is trying to tell you today, it's time to stop trying to go back to the dead things in your life and turn to life and start following Jesus who said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the life. God is saying, stop turning your life back towards the dead things of this world and turn your heart towards life, which is only found in Jesus Christ. Now I want to close, I want to close with this story. And maybe you've heard this story from me before, but it's the story of how these hunters would hunt wolves in the snow. And they would take their knife blade, the hunter, and coat it with animal blood and then freeze it. And then coat it with another layer of animal blood and then freeze it again. And then coat it with the third layer of animal blood and then freeze it so it had three layers of animal blood and three layers of ice over the animal blood. And the hunter would go out in the nighttime and stick the knife in the snow with the blade facing up. And eventually the wolf comes around and it smells animal blood and walks up to the knife blade and begins to lick it. And he starts to lick it more feverishly because he realizes that like it must be under some layer of snow. And it gets through the first layer. And then it tastes the animal blood. Oh man, there it is. And just a little taste makes him dive all the way in from curiosity to I'm doing this. And it starts licking faster and faster through the next layer of ice, through the next layer of blood, through the next layer of ice and the next layer of blood. He's licking so fast and so feverishly. He's licking so, so hard that he doesn't realize his own tongue is sliced open. He doesn't realize he's now eating his own animal blood. And then eventually, he licks that knife blade to his death. See, many of you today, you're licking the knife blade of life. Yeah. You're consuming the things of this world that they're eventually going to kill you. You become so numb to the sin of the world. You become numb to lust. You become numb to pornography. You become numb to partying, getting wasted and plastic. You become numb to getting high. You become numb to anger. You become numb. And you don't even know it's going to kill you. It's just a matter of time. And you're feeding off things that are dead, hoping that they'll bring you life. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. Follow me. Give it up. Give it up. It's time to move from surrounded to surrender. Would you stand to your feet with me? Come on, stand to your feet. Would you close your eyes with me? Close your eyes. I want everybody to do this with me. I, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to lift your hands 
to the heavens. Come on, both hands, both hands in the air. Lift your hands, lift your hands. Jesus, today, my prayer is that we give it to you. That we give it to you. We give it to you. We truly give it to you. Father, I pray for every person in this room today because, Lord, I know that I know that I know you've been speaking to every heart, every heart, because this is your word from the holy written word of God. And the Bible says that your word, it will never return void. The Bible says about the Bible that It is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides soul from spirit. It says it divides joints from marrow. See, the Word of God has a way of slicing your soul and separating your flesh and your spirit. See, that's one of the things that I love because the world's confused about right and wrong. The world's confused about truth and lies. The world has become confused about what's black and white. No, 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 we must be gray. No, no, no. The Bible is black. The Bible is white. The Bible is not gray. The Bible is not confused. The Bible is truth. And I love for my own life I don't like it, but I love it that it cuts me, that it cuts me. God, we pray tonight that you cut, 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 God. God, that you do surgery. God, surgery on us. God, that you open us up. God, that you open us up, that you open us up today. You you can put your hand down just for a minute because I want to ask a question. If you're here today and you say, P.T., Man, I am not a Christian. I am not a believer. I do not follow him. All that stuff about saying you got saved. I'm not saved today. But man, I feel like God is calling me right now and I want to get saved. I feel like God is speaking to my heart right now and I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. If that's you right now, this is your moment. This is your moment. If you say PT, that's me. I need to move from surrounded to surrendered. On the count of three, I want you to lift up your hand. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? One, come on, two, come on, three. Lift up your hands right now. I want to move from surrounded to surrendered. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. Come on, I want to move from surrounded to surrendered. Listen, this this is crazy. You can call me crazy if you want, but I am crazy. You can say, man, that dude's lost his mind. I'm good with that. I lost my mind. I lost my mind. If you raised your hand and you said, you're talking to me, I want to move from surrounded to surrendered right now. I want to move from pretender to surrender right now. I want to, I want to get into the middle of the presence. If that's you right now, I want you, if you raised your hand, I want you to come to the front right now because I want to pray specifically for you. I want you to come to the front. Come on, come to the front. Come to the altar, baby. Come to the altar, baby. Come to the, come on, come on, come to the front. Let's go. Come on, come on, baby. Come to the altar. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, don't be shy. Come on. Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been right there. I've been right there. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Come on, come to the altar. Yeah, come to the altar. Okay, this is what I want you to do because on February 20th of 1993 at midnight, I entered my pastor's house. And I I did something I did not want to do. I wasn't comfortable. I had to get out of my comfort zone. Hey, listen, I was a baseball player, man, so I had chewing tobacco in my pocket because every baseball player's got to have chewing tobacco. And and I was on, I was on, I was, I got out of the car, I had a can of tobacco, but I was going into the preacher's house. 
You know what I did? I said, I can't take that in the holy house. I took it out of my pocket and I threw it in a bush. They found it the next day. They knew it was mine. Listen, for you, you that came, you, you're entering the house, man. You're entering the house. This is the house. This is where you belong. You belong here. You belong here. You belong here. This is where you belong. We, we are your family. We are your family. You don't have to understand it all. You don't have to understand it all, but I promise you this. When you give it up, when you plant the seed, it's amazing what God will do. It's incredible what God will do with the seed that is planted. You could have held on to that seed and stayed in your seat. You said, no, I'm planting this seed right now. I'm planting this seed. And listen, listen, this is, this is what's really crazy about the scripture that I read, the scripture that I opened with. Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat fall to the earth and be buried and die, you know that Jesus is actually talking about himself. And I'm going to die for you. And I'm going to be put in the tomb. Then I'm going to come back to life again. That's what this is about. So if you're in the front, I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. If you're not in the front, I want you just to, would you just stretch a hand towards everybody in the front? Just stretch a hand. If you're in the front, I want you just, would you do me a favor? Would you just lift your hands to the Lord right now? Lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your hands. It might seem weird, but it's really simple. It's just this symbol of, it's just a symbol of surrender. God, I surrender. Like, God, I got nothing to hide. Here, here's my hands. Here's my hands. God, I got nothing to hide. I'm surrendering to you. And this is what I want us to pray. I want us to pray. In fact, I, I want everybody in the building to pray this prayer out loud. Repeat this prayer after me. Ready? Here we go. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus today, today on, this very night, on this very night, I surrender my life to you. I, I want to live for you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for paying the price of my sins. Thank you for unconditional love. And God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Today I choose you. Today I choose your word and not the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give these guys a round of applause.